Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Winchester. As you can see, I'm standing outside making this recording somewhere in the middle of Versailles. As you can see the castle in the background. As I'm told that the spoken word today is about the garden and how we rope, uh, reap what we sow. As you know, I have a couple of passions. One of those passions is gardening. And a couple of weeks ago, I decided to plant 70 tomato plants and the frost came and took about 15 of them, but I had plenty. I had over 700 plants in my greenhouse, so we were able to replace them. God is good. And again, it is what we sow, is if what we reap. Again, welcome to the First Baptist Church of Winchester. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We just let the spoken word fill us. Let uh, the fellowship, although it may be difficult still, we thank you for the opportunity. We know that you're in charge. We know that, uh, that we'll get through this. But today, let us focus directly on you. Let all of our eyes and our, and our ears and our spirit be focused on you. Let us to continue to worship. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. It's in his name. Amen.
is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other have ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bid me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tell. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. Uh, we jump into the uh, fourth week here in Jacob's story. Uh, but before we begin, I'm reminded of the story of C.S. Lewis and the time he got a piece of mail uh, uh, delivered to him. And the person, it was an English, an American person, asking for some advice from C.S. Lewis. And of course, at the time, C.S. Lewis was like the most notable Christian figure in the world. And so people often looked to him for guidance. And so he wrote this gentleman back uh, the advice. And he said, uh, I'm giving you the best advice that I could offer. However, at the end of the letter, this is what C.S. Lewis said. And I really, really appreciate it. He said, friend, think of me as a fellow patient in the same hospital that you're in who, having arrived just a touch earlier, can give you advice on how things work. I love that. I just love that. A fellow patient. And, and so what's he saying? He's saying the reality is, is that we are all going to be wounded by life in one way or another. Our souls are going to be distressed. Our bodies are going to be broken down because life has a way of tearing us down. Nobody is excluded from that reality. And so in a sense, like C.S. Lewis said, we're all fellow patients needing a touch from the great physician to administer his grace upon our lives. Or as D.T. Niles would say it some years later, he said, listen, Christianity all comes down to this one thing. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And so I guess with that in mind this morning, I come to you as one beggar telling other beggars where you can find spiritual nourishment and food for your soul. And it is found in this next portion of Jacob's life. Now, it's a story that doesn't get a lot of airtime, but I have come to see it as perhaps one of the most essential stories in the Bible. And I believe, I really truly believe that contained in this next portion of, 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 of Jacob's life is perhaps some of the most powerful truths contained in all our faith. Because this story is foundational to our understanding to, uh, uh, to our, our understanding of the nature and the character of God. And how we see these truths, they will directly influence the way that you and I see God. And the way that you and I, and, and the reason that's important is because the way that you and I see God often, oftentimes influences the way we treat others. And the way we treat others oftentimes comes as a result of how we see ourselves. And how we see ourselves then is oftentimes a way of, uh, comes as a result of how we see God. 
And I, I truly believe the truth outlined in this next portion of scripture has the potential to radically alter the way you view God, the way you relate to other people, and the way you see yourself. Because if you have ever just felt like you have, you've just kept messing up with one sin or you just kept messing up in a certain area of your life, this is a story for you. Or perhaps you know somebody who just kept stumbling time after time after time. This is a story for us. This is what I call a game changer. And so this morning we're going to look at, uh, we're going to be looking at Jacob's marriages because he gets married twice, but we'll cover that a little bit more here in a second. Um, and, but, and we'll do, we'll soon discover that he has a tricky father-in-law who pulls a fast one on him. And then we'll discover really that everybody in this story and everybody, every character that we come in contact with really is heartbroken and is really is flawed. They're just flawed in different ways. And you might say that every single character that we meet today is a fellow patient and torn down by life. And so as we look at this story, we will consider two things, and I promise you we will get to both things, okay? We will consider two things, and that is this, the single greatest truth in our faith. I believe contained in this next story of Jacob's life is the single greatest truth that we need to be reminded of and the single greatest choice that we have as believers. We get to see the single greatest truth and then we come to see the single greatest choice that we are given as believers. So let's recap Joseph or uh, Jacob's story for a second. He comes from a great family, um, a spiritual dynasty family, uh, but we learn that they're all flawed. And yet God still moves in their lives and he moves powerfully, which is good news for you and I, because that means God's going to move in our family's lives. Jacob has a twin brother, and did I mention he's hairy? But we're not going to get into that today. And both of these boys have been fighting in the womb since they first were conceived. And Esau, of course, they come out fighting. And so Jacob tricks Esau into giving him his birthright. And then he downright steals from Esau the blessing. And Esau, of course, is terribly upset at Jacob. And he, and he says, I'm, I'm out to kill you. And so Jacob flees from his entire family. And now Jacob is in the middle of nowhere um, and he's on the run. And then he has this profound experience with God where he sleeps on a rock and has this huge experience with God. And he now comes to understand, listen, it's not that I'm nowhere, but God is now here. He has not forsaken me. God is in this place. And that's where our story picks up today. Jacob is still on the run, but he, he, he has now reached his destination. And so he stops at this well um, and, and he sees this beautiful, magnificent, this gorgeous woman um, whose name is Rachel. And he sees her. And, and let me just paraphrase what happened. He said, man, I got to marry that woman. He said, wow, that, that, that I got to marry her. I got to put a ring on that woman. And so, um, and so Jacob goes to her father, whose father's name is Laban, and says, listen, I am smitten with your daughter. Thou art smitten with your daughter. I must marry her at once. And so Laban says, okay. You can marry her. Absolutely. Yes, Jacob, you can marry her. But here's the deal. I need you to work seven years for me. Jacob says, deal. Uh, count me in. That, I, can do that pro I can do that deal. No problem. Put some hot sauce on it. We'll stamp it. We'll call it a day. And the text literally says that Jacob, that Jacob spent those seven years, but it was like, it was just like a few days to him because he was so smitten with Rachel's, be with Rachel's beauty. But on their wedding night, Jacob tricked, or Laban tricked Jacob into marrying his oldest daughter, Leah. And while Rachel was beautiful and lovely in form, the Bible says that Leah was 
weak-eyed. Does that mean she was cross-eyed? I, I don't think so. This could have been, but uh, I think what it meant was that she was not outwardly attractive. And Jacob is furious at Laban when he discovers the deception and he goes to Laban to figure it out what happened. He said, hey, hey, God, what happened? I, I worked seven years so that I could marry Rachel. And Laban says, listen, I understand you're frustrated, um, but if you still want to marry Rachel, you can, but you need to work another seven years for me. And Jacob says, okay, I'll take that deal. And Jacob worked another seven years, and yet he still married Leah, the older, weak-eyed sister. And as a result, as a result of that, Jacob hated Leah. He would sleep with Leah, but he would despise Leah. He would use Leah. He would abuse Leah. He would come to hate Leah. And all the while, he's longing for Rachel. And that's where our story picks up in Genesis chapter 29. Um, and so I'll read this with you. Jap uh, Genesis 29 verse 31 says this. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, remember, Jacob did not love her. He loved Rachel. He enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. And Leah became pregnant. And gave birth to a son. She named that first son Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord sees my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. But friends, did Jacob love her now? Absolutely not. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. And so she named him Simeon. But still Jacob did not love her. Again, she was conceived and she gave birth to a son and she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him now three sons. And this one is named Levi. But yet still, Jacob wanted nothing to do with her. He still did not love her. And then in verse 35, something powerful happens. Watch this. It says, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. And so she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. So she got her eyes off her problem and focused on God. But here's what's so amazing about this story is that Leah had this son named Judah and Judah would have another son and that son would have another son and that son would have another son and go on and on and on until you get to this one guy you might have heard before. Have you ever heard the name Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ is directly connected and he comes from this lineage of Leah. And so what we learn is out of a really, really ugly situation, God moved. One of the greatest truths of our faith is that the worst things are rarely ever the last things. The worst things in life are typically never the last things in life. I truly believe that is one of the greatest truths communicated in our faith. God can bring growth, he can bring grace, and he can bring restoration out of any situation. Jesus would even say that even when people are at the end of their rope, God can transform and redeem that very situation. And so here's the great truth. Here's the great hope. As bad as your situation might be, and friends, some of you this morning are in a very bad situation. The great hope is that he can still bring something good out of it. He can redeem it. I mean, just think of Jesus on the cross. Every one of his followers thought that the worst thing had happened. They had been following this guy for three years and they saw him hanging on a cross and it was as if all their hopes and dreams were dashed in that very moment. But God took what was perceived as the very worst thing and turned it into the very best thing for all of mankind. And I know this, never ever 
give up on God's ability to redeem and restore a situation. Friend, you can bet your life on that truth. I believe that is one of the most powerful truths contained in our faith. And so that's one of the greatest truths contained in our faith. Now let's talk about what is perhaps one of the greatest choices that you and I get to make. Well, did you notice something about that story there about Jacob and Laban? Uh, it says that Jacob got what? He got tricked. He got tricked by Laban um, into marrying Leah. Jacob, the trickster who was manipulating people his whole, whole life and scheming for things his whole life, he got played. He got tricked. The trickster got tricked. A more common way uh, of saying this is, is like this. You reap what you sow. Have you ever heard that phrase? You reap what you sow. Listen, this is not, it's not just like an Uncle Tonyism for you. This is a law in life. You reap what you sow. You plant what you reap. Now, we have a lot of tobacco farmers in our church. Yes? Yes, we do. Um, and so I spent some time out with them because I want to get to know them. And I want to know what it's like to be a farmer. Though, you know, I kind of want to be a farmer, but I don't think I'm ever really cut out to be a farmer. But I like to pretend that I might be a farmer one day. And so I go out and I go riding with them back when you could ride with, you know, in cars with other people without wearing a mask and fearing for, well, well that's a whole nother sermon another time. But, you know, one of the things is when you go out with them on their farms, if you plant a, a field full of tobacco, it's not coming back as a harvest full of watermelon. It's just not going to happen. If you plant corn, it's not coming back as an avocado tree. Not going to happen. Why? Because this is the principle in life. You reap what you sow. Listen to what Galatians 6 says. It says this. <clears throat> Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul says it this way. In this life, you will harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that very sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit of God will harvest everlasting truth from the Spirit of God. So what does it mean? Reaping and sowing is essentially about blessing and consequences, right? Like if you cheat on your taxes, guess what? You're probably going to get an audit. If you cheat on your, your spouse, guess what? You're going to have a frail and broken marriage. If you have an unchecked and un, if you have an unchecked prideful heart and you don't really even care about it, you're okay with that prideful heart. Well, then it will actually be a barrier between you and God. Actually, the text says that God will actually oppose you. You reap what you sow in this life. And I think that's what we're seeing in this story being played out in Jacob's life. The trickster got tricked. He reaped what he sowed. Oh, but here it is. Here it is. Here's, here's what I believe the greatest choice in all the Christian faith is. You ready for this? The good news of the gospel is that you can plant a new garden every day. And if you tend to it, it'll actually taste better in the future. The greatest choice that you and I have is that we can plant a new garden every day. Yes, we reap what we sow, but in Christ, we can plant a new garden every single day. We serve a God who makes all things new and gives us new mercies each day. So what this also means then is that when we are at our lowest and our weakest and we're sowing seeds of discourse, we can rely on his strength because he will always be at his greatest and strongest. And so what I'm saying is if you place your trust in Christ, he can turn it around. I don't know how he does it, but he can turn it around. He says, actually, he, he says, may, he can make the thing that you thought was the worst thing and turn it around to be the very best thing in your life. No, yes, it might be a painful experience, but he will bring about ultimate good from it if you will trust him.
The gospel says it doesn't matter how much, like how many seeds of discourse and, and, and destruction and chaos and, uh, and sin that you have sown in your life. Listen, if you trust God and you place that trust in, God, in Christ, he can turn it around and make it work for your ultimate good. And I recognize that this morning that there are some people underneath the sound of my voice that need to plant new gardens. They need to plant new gardens in different areas of their life. For mainly, I, th I think this morning that there are some that need to plant new gardens in their marriages. They have been sowing seeds of friction and discourse and frustration and bitterness. And you need God to new, do and work and, and do a new work in your marriage. And when you trust Christ with that, he can make it new and he can make it whole. And there are some who, who have toxic relationships with people in the church or with people outside the church. And you've been sowing seeds of gossip, sowing seeds of frustration, sowing seeds of, uh, of negative speak. And so what you're reaping is just a, a myriad of negative relationships. And listen, through the gospel, if you put those relationships in Christ, he can actually make them stable and healthy and whole. And for some of you, there are some that need to plant the new garden with your life. Everything you have tried has left you feeling like you were not fulfilled. You've been looking for meaning in all the wrong places, and yet you still find yourself empty. Friend, it's not that the grass is greener on the other side of the street. It's that you need to give your life to him and plant a new garden in Christ. And this is the greatest choice we have as Christians is that we don't have to live in the past and we don't have to wait on the future, but through the power of Christ, we can plant a new garden every single day and he can turn it all around. As we close, listen to Psalm 125. Just let, let these words minister to your heart. Let these words flood over your heart for a moment. Psalm 125, verse 5. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. The worst things are never the last things in Christ. And with each new day, you can plant a new garden in Christ. He can turn it all around. Grace and peace unto you.
the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secure. As long as life endures, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, honey. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever